happy to see you again. And this is being recorded with me, Tim McKibben, the CEO of the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, who has uh, got to be one of the most viewed people in real estate at the moment. Everyone wants a piece of him because everyone's confused. Everyone's confused. Even the media is saying everyone's confused. And the role of these sessions with Tim is to maybe not get you to being zero confused, but reduce your confusion level, right? Reduce your confusion level. So we had a great session the other day, Tim, gave a lot of clarity to, um, to, uh, to people, gave a lot of clarity. And please, when people, a lot of people ring me up, Tim, and they say, I'm upset about that, Tom. I want you to understand if you're upset about it, it's like, it's like going to the doctor with a broken leg and doctors showing you the x-ray and saying it's broken here and you get angry with the doctor. Hey, we're just giving you the information. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> right? So, Tim, we're going to talk about rent, evictions, rent, monitoriums. Tell us... Uh, We've got a presentation deck that we're going to run through here. Yes, and uh, you, you had some record views of it earlier on when you were showing it to uh, the REI members. So uh, let me uh, share my screen here. And what I'm going to do is uh, use this slide deck here, which, Tim, can you see that? No. Susan? Susan? No, we can't see you and we can't see the slide deck. Okay, let's try it again. Share content, share screen, uh, start broadcast, three, two, one. Now, let's give it a go now. Yeah. What about now? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Well done. Uh, but okay. We can't, you, you, and you are off screen. We can't see your face, by the way. You can't see my face? No. Okay, let's have a look here. Let's bring this here. Now we can uh, see your face, but we can't see the screen. So this is like okay. Tech Tuesdays with Tom. Tech Tuesdays with Tom. So how about we do this? But it, more importantly, Susan, can you see can you see Tim? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm happy for I'm happy, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to have um or I Tim can share and, the screen. Or you can share the screen. Have you got the presentation? Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Here, let's bring this here. Now we can see your face, but we can't see the screen. So this Stop sharing. Over to you, Susan. Sorry, I actually don't have this present. I'm just looking at the emails. Okay. <laughs> Oh, hold on. No, I do. Yes, I do. All right. Thank you. How long, by the way, Tim, how long does this rent monitorium last for? To the 11th of September. Possibly. Right. I'll, uh, I'll get into that in a second. It's a very okay. good question. Okay. Yesterday, Tom, um, you were talking about uh, confusion. So um, I had a joke with my team yesterday and I said to them, another day, another uh, health order. You've heard me talk about the health orders. Well, yes. yesterday we got two health orders, two separate ones that, that modified uh, what we had in the morning. So we started out with uh, uh, something rock solid in the morning, whether we liked it or we didn't. And then that got changed. Uh, yes. About um, I don't know three o'clock in the afternoon, and then it got changed again. Wow! So trying to keep up with it is a full time job. So Tim, let me ask you on that. You know, when when we use the term health order, right? Yeah. Who does the health order come from? The minister. So in this case, Minister Hazard. So 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 because a lot of people get confused. A lot of people say, "Oh, what's the Office of Fair Trading say?" So this hasn't got nothing to do with the Office of Fair Trading. No, this is the health. So, so what we're about to talk about now, that, that is all about the Office of Fair Trading. But the health department is, uh, is the one that's controlling this. Having said that, though, Fair Trading are also involved in 
in, in the health order that they become involved in that um, with advice and uh, I, I even think some policing. Okay, so, so um, um, today we're gonna talk about something that the Office of Fair Trading has put out, is that right? It's, well, it's their, uh, it, it's their um, area. So they've, they've put out the, um, the regulation. So, so this is a regulation, not an order. Um, having said that though, it's the minister who puts out the regulation. Uh, but, okay. the, but the regulation has a, as far as a journey through the system, the regulation has to go to the governor to be signed off. Um, All right. whereas, whereas an order is made under the emergency powers that are given to the minister. Okay. And that's, a, that's yeah. the reason, that's the reason they can issue these orders one after the other. Okay. Um, so Susan, let's bring up the presentation. Um, and that can keep us in a structured way and that'll ensure that we cover all the content. So let's move on to that first page. The, uh, um, so the history for context, over to you, Tim. Yeah, so I just thought it might be valuable to start here, Tom, because a lot of, uh, a lot of landlords uh, and for that matter agents would have remembered last year when there was a reasonably complicated um, rag put out um, uh, a support, a, res a, a residential package put out to support uh, tenants. And there was a requirement within that to waive some of the rent and you could defer some of the rent. And then there was also an extended time to, to pay the rent. So if, if the amount was being deferred for um, six months or whatever it was, and then, then the tenant had the opportunity um, to be able to pay pay it back over time. So, and in fact, I think some of those arrangements are still on foot. Um, but at that time, there was no assistance provided whatsoever to, to landlords. And, and that, was, that was out of step with the rest of the country because all the way around uh, every other state, the government had given support to landlords. Now, when I say support to landlords, it's, it is really support to tenants because the money comes through to the landlord and that money is used to offset the rent that the tenant is, um, is paying or has to pay. So um, the point we've always made is uh, support for landlords is actually support for tenants. Got you. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to that next slide, Susan. So um, for those who want to have a read of it, um, it's not a very long document and that's, uh, that is good in itself. Um, it's, uh, that is, that's the name of it, the Residential Tenancies uh, COVID Pandemic Emergency Response. If you go and do a search for that, you'll find it. Um, its start date is the 14th of July um, and it finishes on midnight, the 11th of September. However, However, to your question earlier, Tom, when you said to me, when does it end? Well, at this stage, it ends on the 11th of September. But rather, rather interestingly, um, in the regulation, it says that it, it is repealed on the 30th of September. And that's, that is code to me to be suggesting at least that the regulation is going to is going to be extended longer than the 11th of September. Well, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a little bit uh, misleading. It, they have the ability without a lot of, um, uh, without a lot of redrafting, if you will, um, to extend it out to the 30th of September. So I just think there's a, there's a message there. That's all. And, and, I, and I think armed with that message, People should, agents and landlords should, should uh, hope for the 11th of September to be the day, but um, maybe it won't. And and this morning, um, as we do every morning, 11 o'clock, we heard the uh, heard the premier say that our our COVID numbers aren't dropping. So put that into the mix. Okay, so that's uh, there's nothing definite there, but all you're sort of saying is, hey, you know. 
this has happened here. So you can read into that. But I think, you know, Tim, I think, you know, what's becoming clear for those of us that live in New South Wales, we've seen, we've seen, um, well, everyone here, I think only, oh, sorry, it's on social media, so there could be non-New South Wales people watching. But we've seen, we've seen the challenge it is to actually, it is as the, the word that they've used is stubborn. We've seen the challenge there is to actually get those numbers down. So I think it would, it should not shock everyone if, if on the 30th of July, there's an extension of what we're doing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next slide, Susan. Um, so orders that, uh, these are questions that I'm regularly asked. So orders that were made prior to the 14th of July, so an eviction order, for example, um, that, that is, um, uh, is still on foot. Um, and the moratorium, which we said was starts on the 14th of July, um, won't uh, set aside those, those orders. So if you have an eviction order, um, you can continue with that, even though the moratorium period starts on the 14th of July. And for that matter, any other direction of NCAT. Um, but at a practical level, Tom, we are hearing from agents that the sheriff uh, is not, um, uh, many of the sheriffs, I should say, in areas just are refusing to go out and serve documents. Yeah. So even though you've got the order, getting service is a problem. And I, I make no comment about that. I, 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 there's, that's beyond my, uh, my area of influence. Yep, yep. Okay, got it. So basically the law says... If they were doing, um, if it was something happening before the 14th of July, uh, what we're talking about doesn't change it. Um, but okay, next slide. So the, the way that it works is with the with the um, moratorium. We're talking about households, so it's it is all of the people that live in that household. So, Tom, if, um, if you and I lived in the property, then together we would be the tenant. So when we talk about the tenant, we're talking about all of the people that are living in, living in that property. So collectively, we make up the tenant. Now, that's important in a second. Um, an impacted tenant, it only applies to rent-paying uh, tenants. So, again, if you or I were living in the property, uh, and I wasn't paying any rent, then as far as the calculations are concerned, to be eligible for the moratorium, it would only relate to you. But in normal cases, people who live in the property, everybody pays a portion of the rent. And then we end up with what is known as an impacted household. Um, as I said to you, these are terms which are defined in the regulation. And if somebody is keen enough to read the regulation, not a particularly big document, you'll see the mechanics of this. But uh, this will make a bit more sense when we go on. Okay, beautiful. Next slide, Susan. So if they're in the house, for, for example, in the rented property, if one or more tenants has lost their job due to COVID, um, they've had to stop working or materially reduce work due to illness. And I'm assuming illness would have to be a COVID related illness because this is COVID related. Uh, another member of the household's illness, make the same comment, or caring for a family member. So if, um, if you have uh, lost your job, you work in a coffee shop and you've lost your job because the coffee shop is shut, then then you, you are an impacted tenant living within an impacted household. But it has to be COVID related. Now, interestingly, they have said here, and I don't understand why, materially reduce the work that you do. So well, I don't, I, I'm a little bit lost to know why they're saying that. And the reason I say that is because that there is a calculation which is quite precise and they're dealing with 25% reduction in the, uh, 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 in the household income. 
So, Susan, we might have the next slide, please. So you can see here that what we need to do to trigger the protections within the uh, moratorium, what is being offered to tenants, is we need a 25% reduction in the household income. And that is to be calculated on the average of the last four weeks back to the 26th of June. So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Let's assume that, um, that you and I um, each week get paid $100. So therefore the household income is, um, is $200. And we get, that happens every week. Um, and what happens then after the four weeks is we add all that up, uh, comes to $800. We divide that by four weeks to get our average and it comes back to $200 is the average weekly income, household income. Then we look at the income that is coming into the property, coming into the, uh, uh, by the tenants bringing it in, um, in the weeks following the 14th of July. And if there is a reduction of more than 25% or 25% and more, then the, the tenant is entitled to the protections of the moratorium. All right, so again, staying with my example, if, um, if I was earning 100 and you were earning 100 and on the 14th of July, I lost my job and I had none, what would, what would happen there is that the 200 that, I would have, that we collectively would have been bringing in is now only 100, we've had a 50% drop in the household income Therefore, we have an entitlement to the protections offered by the moratorium. Okay, so um, okay, I get that. Add back any add back any government support. Yeah. So so, so, so with the um, with the government support, let's assume again with my example that I lost my job, but the government um, support, either federal or state or both. Um, was giving me $50, um, then what's happened there is the $100 I lost, $50 of it was being replaced by government, um, by government subsidies. So yes, I've lost my job because of COVID. And yes, I've lost all of the income that I was earning because of COVID, but I've been able to recover 50% of it um, because of government subsidies. Now, one of the, so that, that has to be added back in. One of the other questions I, uh, I get um, is that we're talking about the, the hardship of one, of one of the people. So back to my example, if I lost my job and you didn't, and, and we are able to get our rent subsidised, you would get um, as much benefit out of that as I would get, even though I haven't got a job. Now, um, the question I'm, I'm regularly asked is, how do, I, how do I get the money through to the impacted tenant, the one that's lost their job? And the reality of it is, and the legalities of it is, you can't. So you have to, as an agent, as a landlord, you apply it against the rent and the, the tenants, whoever they are, um, they have to work it out amongst themselves. So, so Tim, am I reading this right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if after you're given back any government support, if that takes you back to, let's assume, less than 25% reduction, let's assume it takes you to 20% reduction, you are not an impacted household. Correct. 100%. Okay. Does that make... Does that, does, Go on, sorry, Tim, go on. No, so, so in that circumstance, Tom, you would not get the benefits of the moratorium. Okay. You would fall you would, outside of it. Okay, you'd fall outside of it. Um, I don't know if you're going to cover that in, this, in the presentation. I'll ask it, and if you say I'm covering it, you will just move on. Um, can an agent uh, ask for evidence yes. of they can? Yeah, we'll get to it. But just okay. um, one practical matter here is that to be able to ascertain um, if we've had a 25% reduction 
in uh, the household income, it means all of the tenants are going to have to put their, their pay packet on the table and say, well, this is how much I earn. Now, some tenants may not find that palatable. Um, and we saw that uh, last year. So somebody's lost their job, but the person who's still got a job wants to keep their financial affairs um, confidential. So they say, no, I'm not prepared to tell everybody how, tell everybody in this house how much I earn. So that is another practical matter that may have to be dealt with by the tenants. Well, I, you earn that much? Oh my God, I had no idea. You dress like a dag. What do you do with all your money? Correct, okay. correct. So you could have those problems. So we'll move on, please, Susan. Okay. Um, so the person who makes the determination as to whether or not uh, they are COVID impacted is the tenant. Okay, so they'll have to sit down, all of the tenants, or if there's just one, that's easy, but they all sit down and, um, uh, and they make this determination that, that they have been impacted. Um, and then they have to notify the landlord um, or the agent uh, representing the landlord that they have um, been impacted and that they have to serve notice on the landlord. Now, this is the bit that I, I have to say I find quite bizarre. Um, to be eligible for the protections of the moratorium, you have to pay minimum 25% of the rent. So if you were paying $100, you now have to pay a minimum of $25. So if you've lost your job and you have no savings at all, no income, and you can't pay the 25%, you don't get the benefit of the moratorium. You don't get the protection. So the landlord could serve a notice of eviction on you because you can't meet that 25% payment of the rent. So um, I, I, I don't know what the policy, policy thinking was behind that. It seems to be that if you're um, a little bit broke, then you're okay. But if you're completely broke, then no, you're not. Um, having said that, this person would have uh, available to them, the person who has no money, the hardship provisions within uh, the Act and with the Residential Tenancies Act, and also I think probably some mediation, um, which would be offered by fair trading. But it's an interesting um, policy decision. So you can, so, so Tim, if you, if you, you know, like, let me get this right. If, if you've hit that, if your household is down by 25%, you're an impacted tenant, then it doesn't matter whether you're down 25% or you're down 95%, both types of examples, all they have to pay is 25% of the rent. At a minimum. At a minimum. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that um, the balance of the rent is forgotten about. That's not the case. The, the point is they have to pay 25% of the rent to to be a, to to have the benefit of the moratorium. Are you going to cover? Are you going to cover? Are you going to cover that that other issue of what yep. actually happens at the end? Okay, beautiful. All right, beautiful. That's all clear. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so the landlord can ask for evidence. So when the um, when the tenant turns up and says, "Here I am, um, I'm COVID impacted, and um, and I want the protections of the." moratorium, um, the landlord is within their rights. And in fact, I think I think has to do this, whether whether they wish or not, and we'll come to why, they um, they can ask the tenant for evidence. Now the the prohibition under the uh, under the moratorium under the regulation is against eviction and also other actions. Now when I say other actions it would be in relation to recovering um, water charges and these sorts of things that under the residential tenancy agreement that the parties have signed, 
enables the landlord to recover those costs. So there is a prohibition on eviction and the recovery of those costs uh, at the same time. Okay, beautiful. That's all clear. Um, so uh, landlord uh, can ask for evidence. Susan, next slide. Now, interestingly, and this is and this is the reason I had my uh, earlier slide, um, because I said to you that at the very first slide in the presentation that landlords had to provide their tenants with support last time, and there was a there was a comp complicated system calculation last time um, where the landlord um, got to um, got to look at, or maybe not look at, but got um, a, a visibility on the tenant's financial circumstances. So if you had $10,000 in the bank, these sorts of things that, that had to come into the equation, the landlord had to waive a certain amount, they had to defer a certain amount, et cetera. Um, that's no longer the case here, that there is no obligation on the landlord to provide any um, financial support at all, should they choose not to. So the tenant will get the benefit of the moratorium, yes, but the landlord doesn't have to <clears throat> defer, the, defer the rent. Um, they can simply say, I'll wait until the 11th of September and then I'll get, my, uh, I'll get whatever rent's due to me. Um, and that's different to what it was last time. So, okay, yeah. So it's more landlord, um, more, more landlord friendly in some ways. Well, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I have to, um, I have to sit and ask myself this question. We were the only state last time, Tom, when we went through this in 2020, that the government didn't provide some assistance to landlords. We were the only one, and um, and we lobbied very hard at that time for some assistance for landlords and um, they wouldn't give it to us, which, which we repeatedly said was um, out of step with the rest of the country and unjust because the, the landlord was effectively financing the difficult financial circumstances of the tenant. Um, the tenant was passing their difficult financial circumstances across to the landlord. That was the only thing that was happening. This time around, they've taken the initiative and stepped into the space with $1,500. Now, um, uh, I don't know whether or not it was the amount of noise we made last time, they didn't want to repeat it, but nonetheless, here we are. So there is a, there is a sum of $1,500 available to the landlord to subsidize the tenant's rent. Now we call it support for landlords, but as you can see, that $1,500 has to be applied to the amount of, of money that the, that the tenant owes in rent. So, so the landlord can, can uh, access that in one of two ways, in cash or in land tax reduction. Now, I would suggest to you most people grab the cash. Um, there's only 16% of landlords pay land tax. So, um, Obviously, 84% of them uh, won't have the option. And I think it's probably a lot cleaner just to get the cash. Um, there's an application for the money uh, on the Fair Trading's website. Now, I can say to you at this stage, Fair Trading haven't built that particular um, uh, part of their website. So, so you're not able to make the application now. And I think that actually has a complication to it, which will come to... Uh, in a little while. So you can't at this stage apply for the $1,500. Um, now, the money, $1,500 that's there, every penny of that has to be applied to the rent owed by the, um, by the tenant. The landlord doesn't get to keep any of that um, as, um, as, as uh, unencumbered cash. So, so the landlord gets $1,500 from the government and they give the tenant $1,500 in rent credit. So um, as you can see there again, my earlier point, 
this is really about um, tenant support, not landlord support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very clear. That's clear. Okay, Can beautiful. I have the next, next slide, please, uh, yeah. Susan. Um, in our um, in our documents that we we're, we're making available to um, uh, to people, and I'm happy to let um, our non-members have access to this as well. Um, I think uh, I think at times like this, Tom, you you throw the doors open and you say to everybody, "How can I help?" So um, we'll do that with these documents. Well we done, well them. done, REI. Well yeah, done. we'll make so them available to uh, to all agents. Um, so this is um, the first letter is the letter to the tenant. When, when the tenant says, I want to make an application for um, the assistance to, uh, to, be, to become an impacted uh, tenant, um, the, the uh, agent will say, okay, that's fine. Here is, a, here is our standard letter. And attaching to that letter will be the rental assistance request application. Now that will take the tenant through all of the things that they have to show um, that will, uh, will enable the agent to assess whether or not they are impacted and whether or not as a consequence, the, uh, the landlord, the agent on behalf of the landlord will be able to apply for the $1,500. So, so this is what I said earlier, I think it is very important that the, um, that the agent uh, ensure that the tenant satisfies that 25% reduction uh, in the income. Because if they don't, and the, uh, and the landlord gives the $1,500, they won't be able to then recover that from, um, from the government. Uh, the last one is the letter to the landlord. So again, once the agent has collected all the information, they can say to the landlord, what do you want to do? Um, do, you want to, do you want to apply for the $1,500, give that to the tenant, or do you want to do nothing? The only thing that um, by, by doing nothing is that um, the tenant does get the benefit of the moratorium, but they wouldn't get the benefit of the $1,500. So um, it would be a decision for the landlord, but I would have thought in all the circumstances, it makes sense to assist the landlord. To assist the tenant, I should say. Beautiful. Might, so, um, Tim, will we be able to get a copy of these and when we email yeah. it all out? Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. The other okay, thing, uh, Tom, I yep. should have mentioned earlier is that we will um, also be making available for agents to be able to connect their their tenants with the areas, the websites that the tenant can go to to get um, financial support. So there is. Um, Services Australia and Services New South Wales both have opportunities within there to, um, to provide uh, the tenant with, a, with an avenue where they can go and get financial support. So I think it makes sense from the agent acting in the best interest of the landlord to be able to say to the tenant, here is where you need to go to go and get, your, um, go and get some support. Um, Beautiful. We might have the, the next slide, please. Next slide. Go. Susan? Thanks, Susan. Um, so the agreement must be in writing. You must have an agreement between the parties. We, um, we had um, input into what that agreement should, um, should cover. Um, and uh, we provided that to Fair Trading. And Fair Trading have that document uh, available on their website. Um, now, so, so what? Once the agreement is struck in principle, um, you'll then go and get that particular document. You'll download it and you'll complete it. Um, the other thing that I want to say, though, Tom, here is in relation to this fifteen hundred dollars, because you give the fifteen hundred dollars in rent reduction, and then you go and make an application for the fifteen hundred dollars. So the obvious question is. What happens if I give the $1,500 rent reduction and the government doesn't give me my $1,500 that they're promising to do for whatever reason? Um, so what I would do in the, uh, in the agreement that we're talking about here, the rent reduction agreement, I would put in there that the parties agree that they will, uh, that, the, that the landlord will provide $1,500 in rent reduction. 
However, if the government doesn't give the landlord the $1,500 that is available to them, then um, that reduction is wound back. Okay, so if I get my money, you get your yeah. money, but if we don't, um, it ain't going to happen. Beautiful, that, that makes that, sense. That seems to me to be um, appropriate. Beautiful, beautiful. Next slide. And Susan, if you feel you need to give me the access now, you could do that. So, uh, Tom, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate time isn't on our side. So this is just a, uh, a workflow that may be of some assistance um, to people when they're trying to put together everything that we've just been talking about. So um, this is the negotiation process. Yes. Um, and then the next slide is... Um, uh, is, is Yep. Is there... Um, I think there's step... Two, yep, so here we go, about applying for the payment. So this is how you go about satisfying, you see the criteria on the left-hand side and how you would go through the process of making an application for the money. But again, I underline um, Fair Trading haven't yet built the, um, the system so that you can do this. Now, again, that, that makes my point again that you give the $1,500 now, but... Um, when, you, when are you going to get the $1,500 and will you get the $1,500 um, concerns me. So uh, make sure that you can reverse out of the agreement if, uh, if needed. And that, Tom, is, um, is all of it. I think I might have a final slide unrelated to this. Um, just a couple of things that I've got the opportunity, Tom. Uh, yesterday afternoon, um, the government, as I said to you earlier, put out a... Um, another health order, and that health order enabled uh, agents to be able to get properties cleaned. So if there is a, um, um, a rental property and one tenant is leaving uh, and a new one is coming in and you want to get the property cleaned, you can now do that. Now, prior to, to us um, lobbying government for this, you weren't allowed to do that, and clearly that was going to be a problem with agents getting cleaners out because cleaning is specifically um, uh, prohibited under, under the new restrictions. But where we, what we're able to do is to show that cleaning for this purposes is not. Um, the other thing I just wanted to point out in the, uh, in the restricted areas, so when we're talking about uh, Fairfield and Canterbury, Bankstown, Liverpool area, um, some people are saying you you can't leave home at all, um, and for for work you you can leave home for work. Yes, you can, but you cannot go outside of your local government area. So if you live in Fairfield and your office is in Fairfield, um, you can go to work. If you live in Fairfield and you have a um, a property you're selling that's in Fairfield, um, you're able to go along to that property. Um, and have a private inspection with that property. What you can't do is go to any other of the suburbs, say Canterbury, Bankstown or Liverpool, if, you, if, if again you live in Fairfield, and you cannot leave Fairfield to go into um, another, um, into Greater Sydney. So, so to labour the point, Tom, if um, your office is in Liverpool and you live in Fairfield, you can't go to Liverpool. You can't go to your office. Okay, well said. Um, Jim, thank I want to... Uh, uh, just one, Jim, uh, just one yeah. very um, uh, last thing to say that um, there is some discussion also flicking around on social media in relation to other restrictions on agents, um, getting photographs taken, styling, and all this sort of thing. Um, that is the normal case. That, at this stage, um, in my interpretation of it, is prohibited. It doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter where you are. Um, okay. And just a shout out, out to our friends in the Orange area, too, who've, uh, who have been locked down in the regional areas. We are looking to uh, put something out for you shortly. Beautiful. Great work. Tim, a, a question that I wanted to ask you is, if... Um, if you've got to do a webinar to another place in Australia and you need a co-pilot on that webinar with you, uh, so two people on a webinar, right? 
Yeah, okay. where's this going? I hope it's not about technology, Tom. No, 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 it's not about technology. I want to ask you, can two people be in the same, can two people be in an office uh, together doing, uh, doing a webinar without masks? Um, you are allowed to take your mask off yes. uh, if, if it is not practical to wear it. So you see every, every morning at 11 o'clock that the, uh, the Premier and the Minister walk up to the microphone and take their mask off. Yes. Um, so, so you can remove your mask. So if you, uh, when you go into the office, you have an obligation to, to have a have mask, mask on and have social yeah. distancing and doing all these things. Um, but if in those circumstances it is necessary for you to be able to speak, to take yeah. your mask off, then my understanding is you can. But if it is uh, reasonably practical for you to uh, not do that, then there is an expectation that you wouldn't. That you wouldn't. Okay. Tim, thank you so much. Outstanding. I'm sure that we're going to be talking again uh, soon. Things are changing. Um, on a on an ongoing basis, you know, we have to say, Tim, like things aren't great, but I tell you what, they could be a lot worse. They could be a lot worse. And with what you've covered today, our property managers, I think, have got a little bit of a pathway um, and a blueprint to everyone that's watching. We are going to send you those great resources that the REI has been kind enough. You know what they're thinking? I'll tell you what they're thinking. If we're nice to our non-members now, they might see the value of being a member, right? You know, and that's not well, a bad I think idea. It's a, it's a little bit uh, bigger than that, Tom. What we're saying is, uh, to quote ScoMo, we're all in this together. Um, and what we need to do is to help one another to get to the other side of it. And if we can do our bit in that, we'll do it. Um, and, um, and that's what we did last time. That's what we'll do this time. All righty, Tim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Signing off, speak to you in the next couple of days. Everyone stay healthy, stay safe. Our thoughts are with you, Orange. But the great news is that you've got some beautiful red wine that you can drink in that part of the world. All righty. See you later. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.